This is KGW News at Noon. Thank you for joining us this noon. I'm Nina Melhoff in for Brenda today and we begin with a touching send off for a firefighter killed while battling a wildfire near Mount Hood this week. In the past hour, first responders from all around our area escorted the body of Thomas Duffy through Hood River for his final flight back home to Montana. They lined up in procession from the funeral home to the airport and from there Duffy will be flown back to Bozeman. Duffy's chopper went down Monday while he was doing water drops on the White River fire. He was working with the U.S. Forest Service through a company in Montana. The White River fire is still burning more than 2,700 acres and is just 10% contained. For the first time in six days, Portland police did not declare a riot at last night's protest, but they did call it an unlawful assembly. A crowd of 200 gathered at the ICE facility building in Portland's South Waterfront area. And police say some in the crowd spray painted the building, shooting a security camera with a paintball gun. Federal officers tried to clear the demonstrators and had bottles, eggs and rocks thrown at them. One officer was injured. Portland police intervened, firing impact munitions and making 11 arrests. Over the last five months, we've been rocked by three major challenges, a pandemic, a devastating recession and a reckoning of our country's racist past. All three of those challenges, boy, they have left their mark. If you haven't been in downtown Portland lately, this morning, Mayor Ted Wheeler met with members of the business community to address their frustrations. We're going to have their reaction to the meeting coming up today at our 4 o'clock news. But the mayor yesterday called for an end to these violent protests, which he says are distracting from the real message of change. Catherine Cook reports. Enough is enough. It's time to rise up and to take immediate steps to repair and beautify our city. On Wednesday, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler addressed growing frustration from those who work in and own businesses downtown. Three months of protests, 23 of them declared riots, have left vandalism, trash, and questions of safety in their wake. Wheeler fears that lost in all of it is the Black Lives Matter movement. We have allowed our proud tradition of progressive protests to be stolen by a few dozen individuals engaged in violence and criminal destruction. Their intent on creating mayhem and attacking and harming people, not just property. That's a line that we can't allow our community to cross, not anymore. The mayor's resolve comes days after he and fellow city council members got a letter from Greg Goodman, co-owner of real estate company Downtown Development Group. As first reported by the Willamette Week, Goodman wrote, you are willfully neglecting your duties as elected officials to keep our city safe and clean. In a statement to KGW, Portland Business Alliance President and CEO Andrew Hone said in part, we're just not seeing the action we need from our elected leaders at all levels of government. Commitments were made several weeks ago, and there's been a failure to fully act on that plan and put in action long-term commitments such as toilets and cleaning stations for those in need and proactive graffiti cleanup and repairs after each night of damage. Between March and July, downtown Portland Clean and Safe says its teams cleaned more than 92,000 bags of trash, biohazards, needles, and graffiti. That's up 12% over the same time last year. They'll team with Solve, the PBA, and others for a downtown cleanup next week. For Wheeler's part, he plans to meet Thursday with downtown stakeholders on how to clean and re-landscape the hardest hit city blocks. We're going to work hand in hand with local employers to restore their confidence and help defray the costs of their improvements. The mayor says the public can expect to hear more from him on Thursday and in the days to come. A response to criticism for many days of silence on these issues. Catherine Cook, KGW News. New this noon, reports from ESPN, NBA players have decided to continue with the season, but tonight's games, they will still be postponed. So that adds three games to the three yesterday that didn't happen. 
Players could return to the court on Friday or this weekend. The league not confirming game times yet. As a result of the Wisconsin police shooting of Jacob Blake, major sports leagues, including the NBA and the Blazers, decided not to play their games in protest. Orlando Sanchez has a closer look at this huge move by the sports world. It was a historic day in sports. Games postponed in multiple leagues across America. The NBA playoffs stopped. All three games postponed, including the Portland Trail Blazers taking on the LA Lakers. But it started with the Milwaukee Bucks boycotting their game against the Orlando Magic. Milwaukee is about 40 miles north of Kenosha, Wisconsin, where Jacob Blake was shot seven times by police on Sunday. Bucks players Sterling Brown and George Hill spoke on behalf of the team. Despite the overwhelming plea for change, there has been no action. So our focus today cannot be on basketball. We are calling for justice for Jacob Blake and demand the officers be held accountable. For this to occur, it is imperative for the Wisconsin State Legislature to reconvene after months of inaction and take up meaningful measures to address issues of police accountability, brutality, and criminal justice reform. The Trailblazers posting this statement to social media saying we stand with Milwaukee, Kenosha, and Jacob Blake. Here are a few ways you can demand justice at this time. The NBA wasn't the only league to take action. These women will continue to have an impact. The WNBA postponed play. The Washington Mystics wearing shirts that spell Jacob Blake with bullet holes on the back. For those of you expecting to see baseball tonight. Multiple Major League Baseball teams postponed games, including the Seattle Mariners. The Portland Timbers also making a statement. They did not play their scheduled game at San Jose tonight. The club saying it supports its players and their decision not to play. It's unclear when the Timbers will play that game. Orlando Sanchez, KGW Sports. Another big headline for us, Damian Lillard has left the NBA bubble in Orlando and has flown home to Portland to have his sprained right knee examined further. Sources are telling ESPN that it's not expected that he would need surgery, but stay tuned. He would have missed last night's game anyway had they played. It's unclear if he'd be able to return to the bubble to finish the series. All eyes are on the White House tonight as President Trump accepts the Republican nomination for president. He's delivering a high profile speech on the South Lawn of the White House. It's the final night of the Republican National Convention. The White House says the speech will be comprehensive and straightforward. Tonight what you're going to hear from President Trump is a very hopeful uh, vision for America. Tonight we'll also hear from the president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, Senate leader Mitch McConnell and Ivanka Trump. As for the Democrats counter programming tonight, vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris will be in D.C. focusing on how a Biden administration would contain COVID-19. Now, there were more than a dozen speakers at the RNC last night, and just like we did with last week's Democratic convention, our Verify team is fact checking some of their statements. Here's Jason Puckett. Let's start with the claim from U.S. Representative Elise Stefanik from New York. President Trump graciously thank and honor our men and women in uniform and sign the largest pay raise for our troops in a decade. This claim is true. Department of Defense charts show that the military pay raise of 3.1% in 2020 was the highest since 2010. Between 2011 and 2019, the average raise was about 1.7%. Next, a claim from congressional candidate Madison Cawthorn. My personal favorite, James Madison, was just 25 years old when he signed the Declaration of Independence. This claim is false. James Madison was 25 years old when the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, but Madison didn't actually sign it. If you look at the Declaration itself or the list of signers kept by the National Archives, Madison's name isn't there. He did go on to sign the Constitution, though, 11 years later in 1787, when he was 36 years old. And finally, a claim from Vice President Mike Pence. Before the first case of the coronavirus spread within the United States, the president took unprecedented action and suspended all travel from China. This claim is false. CDC documents show that the first U.S. COVID case was diagnosed on January 20th. President Trump signed that proclamation banning travel to China on January 31st, 
11 days later. The president's travel ban proclamation actually starts by acknowledging the U.S. has, quote, confirmed cases. Folks, we have a lot more claims from all nights of the RNC up on our website. If you see a claim you want us to look into, send us an email. With your Verify, I'm Jason Puckett. And you can watch the full coverage of night four of the RNC right here on KGW. Coverage begins at 7 o'clock. Well, we have been tracking the damage left behind by Hurricane Laura all day. Communities along the Gulf saw high, uh, strong winds and high water levels. Things really bad there right now. Cars were crushed by trees and signs. Buildings destroyed. The hurricane has now weakened to a tropical storm, but winds are still 70 miles an hour. More than 700,000 people in Louisiana and Texas right now don't have power. That storm could still cause flash flooding and tornadoes.